Good morning and welcome back to the lecture series on narrative mode and fiction. So, we are discussing science fiction. Science fiction evinces how technological developments can function to further propagate racist assumptions and colonial practices. So, this is in continuation from our earlier lecture, I was talking about how science fiction's uh, conjectures, extrapolations, speculations can make a very rich and uh, meaningful commentary on post-colonialism, on uh, feminism. They can have, you know, the feminist and the post-colonial perspective and, uh, you know, or feminist and post-colonial interventions of uh, the common uh, social practices, the, the naturalized, uh, uh, you know, hierarchies and hegemony that we experience, uh, the, the social institutions that are uh, naturally and inherently unequal in nature. Science fiction uh, in this uh, respect is not very different from magical realism other than for the fact that it has at its core some scientific assumptions. So, the improbable, the implausible, uh, almost the impossible, uh, you know, is used towards uh, criticizing some form of uh, social, political, religious uh, practice, gender practice. So, we see uh, uh, for example, uh, we were talking about the uh, techno-orientalism. So, uh, it draws attention to processes of uh, racialization which are naturalized and that continue uh, to mark the Asian bodies, uh, and how the Asian body is uh, seen uh, by the western part of the globe which reduces uh, the Asian to instruments of scientific exoticism. They are uh, seen as exotic, as uh, radically uh, different, other, almost uh, uh, very different from the standardized, uh, you know, human values that shape the uh, Western world, the Western cosmos. So, techno orientalism imagines Asians as. Uh, either hypo or hyper technical in terms of cultural productions and political discourse. Uh, and and uh, so, science fiction is deeply interested in how Asians become uh, aberrant uh, uh, through the treatment of techno orientalism. Asians are uh, either uh, lacking the technical knowledge or they have become uh, so obsessed with uh, technology as to uh, turn into robots, into automatons. Uh, for example, we see how ideas of racism are integrated into the technology uh, where Japan is given an alienated and dehumanized, uh, uh, almost an empty dystopian image of capitalist progress. Uh, such that the Japanese people are perceived as unfeeling aliens there. They cannot almost be, uh, you know, they, they almost cannot be measured in terms of uh, human values, human parameters. They are technologically so advanced as to uh, behave like uh, or seem like aliens. This is a very uh, racist western perception. So, the Afro diaspora has a long history of engagement uh, with the genre of science fiction. Afrofuturism deploys utopian perspectives in order to critique uh, dystopian realities, suggesting alternative possibilities of future which are both contradictory and complex. Uh, rather than unilinear and destructive, Afrofuturism uh, makes a model for how the indigenous people and people of color view and produce futuristic art in a techno-scientific culture, in a techno-scientific uh, milieu, uh, thereby resisting the erasure of their narratives in the ecosystems of techno-science. So, what preceded science? What preceded the 
techno scientific culture which uh, whose whose epicenter is the western world um, the african society had its own belief system its own world view uh, so afrofuturism is trying to uh, you know marry the in a way the indigenous people's way of life uh, uh, and their viewpoint with the techno scientific culture what kind of futuristic art will such a marriage such a combination produce according to vandana singh and i uh, you know according to vandana singh in a speculative manifesto uh, while speculative fiction has not really fully realized its transgressive potential dominated as it has been by white male techno fantasies there is still a strong undercurrent of writing that questions and subverts dominant paradigms and persists in asking uncomfortable questions about technological and social issues nuclear war or genetic engineering so darko suvin uh, argues that the literary quality which bears the critical and oppositional potential of science fiction is uh, lost when uh, the media of film uh, you know invades it uh, within the media of film which uh, generally banks on special effects which capitalizes special effects um, especially in the case of hollywood in the hollywoodized avatars the oppositional potential the critical potential of a uh, science fiction is somehow vitiated so darko suvin in other words says that literary uh, you know productions of science fiction are much stronger much more powerful in effect than the filmic versions the filmic renditions carl friedman in critical theory and science fiction published in 2000 argues that the pulp tradition uh distracted uh from science fiction as the uh, latter's roots uh, are uh, you know connected more to the classical utopia such as a jewels writings so science fiction connects more with or or science fiction traces uh a jewels as one of its uh, uh you know forefathers or or its foregrounding uh, figures one of its pioneer figures on the other hand pulp uh, science fiction obstructs the critical uh, vitality of this genre it's this genre's uh, capacity to criticize to comment on um, social evils is uh, weakened in the avatar of pulp science fiction Uh, the classical version uh, you know that is uh, you know descending from hg wells does it uh, in a more uh, efficient fashion this vitality lies in pointing to and contrasting with the deprivations of mundane reality so the deprivations the lack uh, present in mundane reality is a uh, commented more meaningfully by the uh, the the classical utopia that is originating from a jewels as a result of the marginalization of non print uh, science fiction uh, by the literary avatar the literary science fiction so uh, we see that there is a clash within science fictional works as well uh, the literary works uh, Uh, claim a superiority to the fiction uh, to the filmic versions and uh, as a result uh, the 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 print versions you know dominate in a way uh, the market and and uh, the the uh, claim as the original versions the classical you know the classic versions of uh, science fiction as a result uh, a separate discourse of science fiction film Uh, which is in distinction from science fiction studies uh, emerges uh, science fiction films bifurcates from science fiction studies proper per se and uh, it further develops uh, 
uh, its field within the discipline of cinema studies. So, in its uh, creative neologism and fictive novelty, science fiction aesthetics is uh, sublime and it exploits poetic forms of expression. Rather than a self-referential artistic experiment, the science fiction poesy or poetic style is motivated by and relevant to the world that it evokes. The poetic quality invites the reader's inner narrative voice uh, to resonate with this imagined world of the author. So, the tension between the reader's world and the narrator's world creates a dialogic pattern. The two worlds dialogizing uh, leads to the churning out of the science fictional work and it entails a constant effort of decoding on the part of the narrator. So, very unlike the modernist and postmodern uh, uh, artworks, science fiction is uh, commonly end directed. Its ends are not uh, loosely uh, left open ended or, or loosely tied. Uh, you know, uh, it uh, rarely uh, encourages or, or entertains any kind of aporia or gap in the end. The ends all converge are tied and uh, that's that's how science fiction that's where science fiction derives its distinct meaning right so science fiction largely draws on the aesthetic techniques and experiences uh, frequently used in cinema uh, such as flashback parallel storyline presence of a strong third person narrator and so on. And we see that a wealth of details and novelty is symptomatic of the classic science fiction. So, in terms of language, um, civilization, technological uh, discoveries and uh, innovations, uh, which may be superficially interwoven with the plot uh, and uh, not indispensable. But uh, all these details, which some of which uh, you know could be done away with, some of which are extraneous, but together all these details, the wealth of details in terms of language, in terms of technological descriptions, you know, they together interweave and, and render a compelling structure, a compelling feature uh, and you know a richness of world building happens through the uh, production of the artwork, through the act of writing. So, all these descriptions, some of which are, uh, you know, uh, extra, do not really contribute to the progression of the plot, uh, but all of them are contributing towards building this alternative world of science fiction. And it uh, engrosses and rivets uh, not only the reader, but the author so much that the author wants to come back to this fabricated world again and again uh, through producing uh, sequels. So, one volume is sometimes not enough because this, uh, this, this world itself, uh, you know, uh, it, in a way, it, it, it wants more, it demands more to be explored, more to be, uh, you know, uh, speculated and uh, uh, extrapolated. Uh, it, it, it leaves, one volume in itself leaves a lot to be desired and so one volume leads to the other. It is a kind of quest, not only on the part of the reader, but also on the part of the author who is producing it. So, seeing science fiction as a sign of its contemporary time, uh, sociologists, psychologists, historians as well as political scientists have uh, often referred to it, have often turned to it. Avowed writers of science fiction uh, in the early 1950s such as uh, Ray Bradbury and John Windham began to attract public attention 
which is reflected in public journals and classroom discussions. So, science fiction offers a projection of hopes and fears about the direction in which a society is proceeding. Its popularity points to a new apocalypticism and occultism and a general cultural shift. With this uh, shifted aesthetic significance, science fiction marks a changed form of contemporary popular expression. So, from here we will get into a specific discussion on the cyborg, which is uh, you know a product of uh, science fictional imagination, science fiction writings, uh, the idea of cyborg that is uh, conceived by Donna Haraway in her uh, well known essay Cyborg Manifesto. Cyborg Manifesto is a socialist feminist work. For Donna Haraway, cyborg or in other words the cybernetic organism is a product of the modern high tech world. Haraway's essay engages with how cyborg can be a locus of identification for feminist critics. So, Haraway studies the farm as a, a species and her location uh, with and social relations with uh, modern science and technology is something that Haraway is interested in. Haraway wants to examine where does the farm, the feminine sit uh, within the uh, larger, uh, you know, scientific and technological advancement. Cyborg refers to a body uh, that has mechanical electrical devices. So, an organic uh, body, a human body, uh, body of uh, 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 human species that has electrical devices, that has, uh, you know, machines. Uh, uh, that makes parts of it function, machines that make parts of it function and, and that can function with uh, greater efficiency than the normal biological human. So, the cy cyborg is uh, more efficient, socially more efficient than the uh, homo sapiens, the biological human. Combination of biological and mechanical refers to a uh, combination or uh, uh, a kind of interface between the human, the organic and the artificial, the synthetic. Cyborg explores technofeminism and transhumanism as a way of understanding notions of gender, race and other minoritized identities. So, the idea of the cybernetic organism or cyborg locates the woman and the farm, the category of the farm within the rise of the network society and within the technological imaginary positions. It tends to historicize the female body through a mechanistic lens. So, rehabilitation of the cyborgs uh, is a way of allegorically resisting the dominant regimes of technoscience. Farm as a category is a conglomeration of the biologic and the technologic in the new technoscientific world. So, the power game uh, in terms of gender, in terms of race, in terms of nationality, ethnicity uh, is purely uh, reshuffled through the presence of the cyborg. Cyborg is a hybrid of a machine and organism. Like I said, it is a hybrid, it stands at the crossroads of reality and fiction. So, contemporary fiction and medicine have many instances of cyborgs, which is a cross between animal or organism uh, and a machine, the organic and the automaton. So, Haraway proposes that by the late 20th century, uh, we all as uh, you know, as, as social existences, we, are, we, we all uh, tend to become chimeras, fabricated hybrids of machines and organs. 
So, the women's experience uh, derived from international women's movement is as much a political fact as it is a fiction. So, we see that within the political discourse of feminism itself, there is hierarchy. Uh, it, it renders visibility to some uh, and uh, it, it transposes the case of the white uh, educated uh, middle class, upper middle class, opulent uh, section women and, and their notion of oppression, their notions of you know uh, inequality to the uh, to, to the black woman, the woman of color, the Dalit woman and so on. So, it, it becomes a very singular narrative. There uh, is a visible hierarchy even within the political discourse within feminism, which is a political movement, right? Uh, as a hybrid of uh, fiction and lived experience, the cybernetic organism changes what counts as women's experience in 20th century. Who is it? it, it goes back to a very fundamental question, who is the woman? What does, what constitutes the woman's body? What is the woman's uh, experience? In other word, words, what cannot be considered as the woman's experience? If the woman experiences this, could she also experience that? Uh, because uh, when we want to incorporate all the realities, all the experiences, we want to live in a plural world, uh, we need to uh, render visibility to all kinds of women's experiences, the experiences of the black, the colored, uh, you know, uh, so the question of language, the question of intersectionalities uh, come in and so experiences become very many, they become uh, layered, they become more difficult. Uh, to crack. There is not one experience coming, uh, you know, uh, top down from the white uh, middle class educated uh, working female. So, Cyborg uh, Manifesto talks about a postmodernist world without gender altogether, which has neither a beginning nor an end, a completely seamless. Uh, society or a seamless uh, world. So, conceptualizing the female body as cyborg implies dismantling these, uh, you know, watertight boundaries, these confines uh, between oppositional categories. So, cybernetic organism is a mishmash of uh, different uh, oppositional categories. And uh, it, it critics, it uh, comments on the categorized bodies that have been traditionally historically controlled and defined uh, as a way of, of flowing into one another. Uh, these categories are uh, kind of uh, liquefied, these categories are, uh, you know, uh, shown as unnatural. So, uh, different classes flow into one another, different genders flow into one another, uh, human animal boundaries are blurred, uh, human machine boundaries are blurred and at, at these, uh, you know, uh, almost implausible uh, crossroads or, or cross sections uh, emerge the uh, cybernetic body, the body of the cyborg. So, cyborg is a creature in the post-gender world which has no origin story uh, like we have in the western biblical sense, uh, but an ironic telos is uh, imagined which results from western life's individuation. So, that celebration of the individual I is present in the concept of uh, cyborg as well. And once the cyborg is uh, rid of all traditional historical categories, its ultimate independence from, you know, gender identity being neither man nor human, uh, from, from a species identity being uh, neither human nor animal uh, or partly both being neither human nor machine, uh, we see that this uh, concept of individuation results ultimately in uh, 
the cyborg being in space in a vacuum in a vacuum in an ahistorical uh, space uh, i mean where where all the older values uh, will be annulled and uh, uh, new values new rules will be uh, shaped uh, that is uh, how uh, that is where that is a kind of milieu environment where donna haraway uh, posits the cyborg the cyborg in a vacuum in space uh, without any a priori categories. So, the cyborg is committed to irony um, and in a way uh, Haraway points out that uh, cyborg has some wicked potentials too. It is, it could be perverse, it is utopian and uh, yet completely without innocence. It is anything but innocent. So, it exists in a setting where public is no longer opposed to private, like I said, all the oppositional categories are going uh, because uh, they have been conceived in that way through uh, a certain uh, understanding or through certain historical happenings which is being nullified uh, basically. Uh, and so, the technological public space uh, is based on uh, revolution uh, in social relations that start uh, right within the precincts of home. The gendered values are reversed, the gendered values and uh, practices are reshuffled and so the uh, game, you know, uh, the game of gender, race, ethnicity, language, uh, nationalism, all of this start afresh from the scratch. That is what, uh, uh, you know, Haraway very interestingly uh, puts forward in this essay, The Cyborg Manifesto. For that, let us meet in our next lecture with another round of discussions. Thank you.